Hello, this is Serene from Exam Hub. Today I will be solving Physics Paper 2 ES Level Structured Questions 9702 Paper 2 Version 3, October November 2019. Starting with question number 1, part A, determine the SI base units of the moment of a force. Moment is force into perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot. Force is equal to mass into acceleration, so it's kg into meters per second square, and distance is in meters. Hence, SI base units for moment is kilograms meter square per second square. Part B A uniform square sheet of card ABCD is freely pivoted by a pin at a point P. The card is held in a vertical plane by an external force in the position shown in figure 1.1. The card has weight 0.15 newtons, which may be considered to act at the center of gravity G. Each side of the card has length 17 centimeters. Point P lies on the horizontal line AC and is 4 centimeters from corner A. Line BD is vertical. The card is released by removing the external force. The card then swings in a vertical plane until it comes to rest. Part 1. Calculate the magnitude of the resultant moment about point P acting on the card immediately after it is released. So when external force is removed and the card is released, the only force which still acts on about P, about this point P, is the card's weight, for which we have to find perpendicular distance from P. So PG is the distance, or I should say the word perpendicular distance from pivot P to the force. PG is the length we had want to calculate moment about point P. First of all, I'll be calculating the length of A to G. A to G can be calculated by using the formula cos theta. Cos theta is equals to adjacent by hypotenuse. Our theta is 45 degrees, adjacent is AG, and hypotenuse, it says that each length of this square is 17 centimeters. Hence, AG is equal to 12.02 centimeters. So the length of A to G is 12.02. We can subtract 4 from 12.02 to get the length of PG. So PG is equal to 12.02 minus 4. And then we have 0 0.08021 meters. I converted centimeters to meters. Now that we have the perpendicular distance from pivot P, and the force 0.15 newtons of weight, we can easily calculate the moment about point P. So moment is equals to force into perpendicular distance between force between that force and the pivot point. The force is 0.15 newtons of weight and the distance was 0 0.08021 meters. You will have a moment of 1.2 into 10 to the power of negative 2 newton meters. Part 2. Explain why when the card has come to rest, its center of gravity is vertically below point P. At this moment, the card has been held by an external force and the second force which is acting on the card is its weight right from the center. When the external force is not uh, being removed, the card actually swings vertically until it comes to rest. When, when this card comes to rest, pivot P would be exactly on top of center of card. So the newer position would be like this. Where A lies on top, B on the right, D on the left, and C at the bottom. And G will be, which is the center point, over here. And pivot P will be right here. So pivot P would be exactly on top of center of card, that is point G, where 0.15 newtons of weight of the card acts. Now the perpendicular distance between P and G has become zero, and hence weight does not have any moment about point P, because for the moment we need the perpendicular distance between the point about, which is P over here, and the force. The force is 0.15 newtons, but the perpendicular distance between point P and force G is zero. So we can write that perpendicular the 
distance between point B and G is zero. Hence, weight has zero moment about P. Question number two, part A, state what is meant by work done. So work done is product of force and distance in the direction of force, in the direction of that force. Part B, a lift of weight 13 kilonewtons is connected by a cable to a motor as shown in figure 2.1. The lift is pulled up a vertically shaft by the cable. A constant frictional force of 2 kilonewtons acts on the lift when it is moving. So the lift is being moved upwards, so the friction force will definitely be downwards. Because friction force acts against the direction of the motion. The variation with time t of the speed v of the lift is shown in figure 2.2. So I'll label the tension first. This is the tension of the cable. So this is the graph of the movement of the lift from time t is equal to 0 to time t is equal to 7 seconds. Part 1. Use figure 2.2 to determine the acceleration of the lift between t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 3 seconds. So acceleration is equals to final velocity minus initial velocity by time interval. From t is equals to 0 to t is equals to 3, the final velocity at t is equals to 3 seconds was 2.4 meters per second. So 2.4 minus the initial velocity which was 0 and the time interval for this change of velocity is 3 seconds. Thus the acceleration is of 0.8 meters per second square. The work done by the motor to raise the lift between time is equals to 3 seconds and t is equals to 6 seconds. So from time t is equals to 3 seconds to time t is equals to 6 seconds, there is no change in velocity of the lift, meaning that the tension force which acts upwards is equal to all the forces that are acting downwards. And all, and all those forces which are acting downwards are weight of the lift plus the friction force so from so within this time interval the force acting upwards is equals to forces acting downwards so tension is what all is acting upwards so weight of the lift is 13 kilonewtons and the frictional force is of 2 kilonewtons so the total tension is going to be the sum of them which it's going to be 15,000 newtons. Work done is equal to force exerted by the lift into the distance it travels in this time interval. Now that we have the tension, we should also have the distance it travels from time t is equal to 3 seconds and time t is equal until t is equal to 6 seconds. That distance in this time interval can be calculated by calculating area under the graph in this time interval so from t is equals to three seconds to t is equals to six seconds it's a rectangle and the area of rectangle is length into breadth where length in this case is th th is of three seconds and breadth is of 2.4 meters per second so distance is equals to three into 2.4 which is equal to 7.2 meters now work done can easily be calculated by multiplying 15,000 with 7.2 meters and then we get a work done as 1.08 into 10 to the power of 5 joules this is the work done or this is the amount of energy being exerted by the lift to bring the lift up Part 2. The motor has an efficiency of 67%. The tension in the cable is 1.6 into 10 to the power of 4 newtons at time t is equal to 2.5 seconds. Determine the input power to the motor at this time. So, percentage 
efficiency is equal to power output divided by power input into 100% and power output in this case is going to be less than power input so one of the formulae of power is equals to force into velocity where our force is this tension force 1.6 into 10 to the power of 4 and at time t is equals to 2.5 seconds we can actually get the velocity right from the graph figure 2.2 at 2.5 seconds we have the velocity of 2 meters per second so into 2 and then we get the power output as 3.2 into 10 to the power of 4 watts um, now our percentage efficiency is 67 percent power output is 3.2 into 10 to the power of 4 divided by the power input into 100 percent and this is how you get the input power as 4.78 into 10 to the power of 4 watts Part 3. State and explain whether the increase in gravitational potential energy of the lift from time t is equal to 0 to time t is equal to 7 seconds is less than the same as or greater than the work done by the motor. The calculation is not required. So just uh, qualitatively, you have to answer this question. They're not asking you to prove um, by doing calculations. So uh, when motor tries to exert a lot of power out of it to raise the lift, but not all of its energy is being used up in lifting that lift. Some of that energy is lost in uh, heat energy in the form of heat energy due to friction force because friction force in this case acts and it has got a magnitude of 2000 newtons and friction force always acts against the motion of the lift. Hence increase in GPE or increase in gravitational potential energy is not going to be equal to the work done by the motor. So we can write that increase in GPE is going to be actually less than the work done and why is there a difference in increase in GPE and work done I already mentioned that it is due to energy converted to heat loss due to friction forces or due to friction. Question number three, part A, state the property of an object that experiences a force when the object is placed in part one, a gravitational field. So it's the mass of the object that experiences um, gravitational force. You can write that mass is that quantity or the property but to an electric field so it's the charge that experiences this electric force so the property is of charge part b a potential difference of 1.2 into 10 to the power of 3 volts is applied between a pair of horizontal metal plates in a vacuum as shown in figure 3.1 the separation of the plates is 3.6 centimeters the electric field between the plates is uniform. A particle of mass went 5.9 into 10 to the power of negative 6 kilograms and charge negative 4.2 into 10 to the power of negative 9 coulombs enters the field at point X with a horizontal velocity. So I must underline this. Horizontal velocity of 0.75 meters per second along a line midway between the two plates. The particle is deflected by the field and hits the top plate at point Y. As you know of the rule that uh, opposite will attract each other since this is of negatively charged it will always be attracted towards the positively charged plate so it deviates upwards part one calculate the magnitude of the electric force acting on the particle in the field so electric force is equals to electric field strength into the charge of the particle and electric field strength is also equal to the voltage divided by the distance between the charged plates so we can equate both of them electric force by charge is equals to voltage by the distance and hence electric force is equals to voltage into charge divided by distance and our voltage in this question is of 1.2 into 10 to the power of 3 
and the charge of the particle is 4.2 into 10 to the power of negative 9 and the distance between the charged plate is 3.6 centimeters and we need to convert that to meters so 3.6 divided by 100 and then we'll have the electric force of 1.40 into 10 to the power of negative 4 newtons Part 2. By considering the resultant vertical force acting on the particle, show that the acceleration of the particle in the electric and gravitational fields is 14 meters per second square. So the formula of resultant force is equal to mass into acceleration. First, we need to find the resultant force. There are two forces that are currently acting on the particle. First is its weight, which acts downward and has a magnitude of 5.9 into 10 to the power of negative 6 into 9.81 newtons and the second force is the electric force uh, with which it is being attracted upwards so the electric force is upwards and that has got a magnitude of 1.4 into 10 to the power of negative 4 from part 1 so the resultant force is going to be equal to the difference between these forces so F is equals to 1.4 into 10 to the power of negative 4 minus 5.9 into 10 to the power of negative 6 into 9.81. And then we have the difference or the resultant force as 8.2 into 10 to the power of negative 5 newtons. And this is going to be acting upwards. That's why it deviates upwards. So 8.2 into 10 to the power of negative 5 is equals to mass of the particle, which is 5.9 into 10 to the power of negative 6 into the acceleration and hence acceleration is equals to 14 meters per second square. Part 3. Determine the time taken for the particle to move from x to y. So while it moves from x to y it is covering, it is in a projectile motion kind of thing where it covers some horizontal distance as well as some vertical distance. At this moment we don't have enough data to cover the uh, horizontal part of the distance being covered by this particle but we can consider the vertical component of it so the acceleration which we got from the previous part is 14 meters per second square because this is what the resultant vertical force caused so the vertical acceleration it was 14 meters per second square initial speed of the particle is zero uh, the vertical distance this particle is covering by moving from x to y is actually this much of distance so 1.8 centimeters is what this particle is covering right while it moves from x to y so s is equals to 0 0.018 meters that was in centimeters so i converted that to meters as this is the si unit and now we need to find time by using the formula s is equals to ut plus 1 by 2 ad square when you substitute your values you will get a time taken of 0 0.051 seconds the distance p of point y from the left hand edge of the top plate so distance p is right from the starting of the plate until point y so this is the horizontal distance this particle covers apart from the vertical distance which it covered was 1.8 centimeters so the vertical component was 1.8 centimeters and they're asking now of the horizontal distance it covers so for horizontal distance we must have the horizontal velocity it starts to move with and the time taken for that movement already in the beginning of the question we highlighted that the horizontal velocity at which this particle is moving is 0.75 and we also need to find the time taken so this distance is equals to horizontal velocity into time and actually the time interval for this motion of the particle is going to be the same for both horizontal and vertical components of this whole projectile motion so i'll use the answer of my previous part and horizontal velocity of was of 0.75 into 0.051 seconds and this will give me the horizontal distance as 0 0.0382 meters
Question number four, a ball X moves along a horizontal frictionless surface and collides with another ball Y as illustrated in figure 4.1. Ball X has mass 0.3 kilograms and initial velocity Vx at an angle of 60 degrees to line AB. Ball Y has mass 0.2 kilograms and initial velocity 6 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees to line AB. The balls stick together during the collision and then travel along line AB as illustrated in figure 4.2. Calculate to three significant figures the component of the initial momentum of ball Y that is perpendicular to line AB. Okay, so the component of Y which acts upwards. So this is what we are asked to calculate. Sine 60 is equals to the vertical component of mass Y what we have to calculate divided by the hypotenuse which is 6 meters per second so the vertical component of the speed of y is equals to 3 root 3 meters per second so the component of the initial momentum of ball y that is perpendicular to line ab is that momentum is equals to mass into velocity what we are calculating is for ball y, so mass of ball y is 0.2 kilograms into the vertical component of the velocity of 6 meters per second is 3 root 3 meters per second and we get the momentum, the component of momentum as 1.04. Part 2, by considering the component of the initial momentum of each ball perpendicular to the line AB, calculate three significant figures Vx. Okay, so vertical component of a momentum of y is 1.04 kilograms meters per second and that of x is vx sine 60 into the mass of x and remember that we have to put the negative sign since the direction is downwards and momentum is a vector quantity. So this is negative and this is positive due to the fact that it moves upwards. So after collision, momentum of both in vertical direction is zero as they both are now moving in a straight line in a horizontal path. So by writing that momentum before collision is equal to momentum after collision momentum before collision in uh, along the y-axis is 1.04 minus vx sine 60 input into 0.3 and momentum after collision along y-axis is 0 so 1.04 the sum of the momentum before collision equals to zero and this is how you get the value of vx as 4.00 meters per second you need to mention 0, 0.00 since they're asking you to calculate to three significant figures part three show that the speed of the two balls after the collision is 2.4 meters per second uh, now for this part we will be calculating the horizontal components of uh, momentum of both x and y before and after collision so horizontal component of momentum of x is towards the right and so is for mass y and after collision along the x-axis the momentum is mass of both x and y multiplied by the combined velocity so the horizontal momentum of x is 4 cos 60 into 0.3 and for y is 6 cos 60 into 0.2 this is equal to 0.6 this is also equals to 0.6 and remember these both are positive since they are moving towards the right and momentum is a vector quantity again momentum uh, before collision in x direction or along the x-axis is equals to momentum after collision in x direction so momentum before collision in the x direction was 6.6 .6 plus 0.6 is equals to momentum after collision 
along the x-axis is the sum of the masses, which is 0.5, into the combined velocity or the velocity they are traveling with. So this V is equal to 2.4 meters per second. Part B, the two balls continue moving together along the horizontal frictionless surface towards a spring as illustrated in figure 4.3. The balls hit the spring and remain stuck together as they decelerate to rest. So they're together while they decelerate to rest. All the kinetic energy of the balls is converted into um, elastic potential energy of the spring. The energy E stored in the spring is given by half of K into X square, where K is the spring constant of the spring and X is its compression. The spring obeys Hooke's law and, a, and has a spring constant of 72 newtons per meter. Part 1 determine the maximum compression of the spring caused by the two balls. So it is said that all kinetic energy of two balls converts to elastic potential energy of the spring. Kinetic energy of the two balls is equal to half of mass of the two balls is 0.5 and the velocity they are traveling with towards the spring is 2.4 square and this gives us the kinetic energy as 1.44 joules now this 1.44 joules is totally getting converted to elastic potential energy which is half of the spring constant for this spring is 72 newtons per meter into x square where x is the compression and this is how you get the maximum compression as 0.20 meters Part 2 on figure 4.4 sketch graphs to show the variation with compression x of the spring from 0 to maximum compression of the magnitude of the deceleration a of the balls. So they have said in the beginning that the two balls decelerate to rest as they hit the spring right over here, which I underlined previously. So with increase in x means with increase in compression, the deceleration actually increases. So there will be a straight line with a positive gradient and it will be through origin. Now the kinetic energy of the balls. So the kinetic energy of the two balls, it is said that it converts completely to elastic potential energy of the spring. So the more the compression, the higher the elastic potential energy, thus kinetic energy decreases when X or compression increases. It will be an increasing slope but the other way around like the increasing slope will be this one but this one over here will be downwards so at x is equals to zero where the compression is zero there will be that maximum amount of kinetic energy and then when x is maximum the compression is maximum the kinetic energy will have been converted to elastic potential energy so the graph will be an increasing slope but downwards while this one over here is a straight line through origin question number five part a light waves emerging from the slits of a diffraction grating are coherent and produce an interference pattern explain what is meant by part one coherence so the waves are coherent if they have the same speed they're traveling with same speed so I can write that the waves have constant phase difference. The two waves which cause interference, they are traveling with constant phase difference. Part two, interference. So interference is caused by a combination of displacements of overlapping waves. Okay. Combination of displacement of overlapping waves part b a narrow beam of light from a laser is an incident normally on a diffraction grating as shown in figure 5.1 Spots of light are seen on a screen positioned parallel to the grating. The angle corresponding to each of the second order maxima is 51 degrees. The number of lines per unit length on the diffraction grating is 6.7 into 10 to the power of 5 per meters. Part 1 to determine the wavelength of the light. So the formula for the diffraction grating is d into sine theta is equals to n into lambda where lambda is the wavelength. 
Hence, lambda is equals to d sine theta divided by n. Or d is equals to 1 by the number of lines per unit length on the diffraction grading, which is 6.7 into 10 to the power of 5. And the theta over here is 51 degrees. And n, the number of maxima that is causing 51 degrees of angle, is 2. So when you substitute all your values, you'll get a wavelength of 5.8 into 10 to the power of negative 7 meters. Part 2 state and explain the change of any to the distance between the second order maximum spots on a screen when the light from the laser is replaced by a light of a shorter wavelength. So according to formula, d sine theta is equals to n lambda, where lambda is equals to d sine theta by n when you decrease the wavelength you also decrease the angle between the maximum order forming so a smaller wavelength actually means that the angle gets smaller too so we can write that angle gets smaller too and hence distance between second order maximum decreases. Question number six, a battery of electromotive force, 12 volts and negligible internal resistance is connected to a network of two lamps and two resistors as shown in figure 6.1. The two lamps in the circuit have equal resistances the two resistors have resistances R and 28 ohms. The lamps are connected at junction X and the resistors are connected at junction Y. The current in the battery is 0.5 amperes and the current in the lamps is 0.2 amperes. Part A. Calculate the resistance of each lamp. So current divides at this junction right over here from 0.5. Only 0.2 amperes of current flows. This means that current across this loop is going to be 0.3 amperes. And also these two parts, they are in parallel to each other because of division and current. That's the rule for parallel circuits or parallel loops. Both lamps are now in series, meaning this lamp and this lamp. And so are these resistors. They are in series to each other. And these two lamps are in series to each other. This also means that um, 12 volts, which is the EMF of the battery over here in the circuit, is going to be the PD across this loop containing two lamps and this loop containing these two resistors meaning again i'll label that 12 volts come to this loop and 12 volts come to this loop again these two resistors are in series with each other and these two lamps are in series with each other while these two components the lamp and the resistors they are in parallel to each other so both lamps they have got equal resistances and equal current flowing because they are in series and in series circuit, the current across each component is the same. So they must have equal PD across them. So 12 volts for this complete loop, for the loop containing these two lamps, means each 6 volts will be passing through each lamp. And this is what the question is asking us to write that resistance for each lamp is voltage divided by current. Voltage across each lamp is 6 volts. And the current across each lamp is 0.2 amperes and this is how you get 30 ohms of resistance for each lamp part 2 resistance r we know the total voltage across this loop containing uh, this resistor r and this resistor of 28 ohms of resistance is having a combined voltage of uh, 12 volts and the current across this loop is 0.3 amperes again the current across R and current across 28 ohms will be equal but the voltage across R is not going to be equal to voltage across 28 ohms because these two resistors are in series with each other so the combined resistance in the series circuit is always the sum of the resistors and now we have the combined voltage for this loop and the combined current for this loop so we can calculate the combined resistance of this loop so resistance is equals to voltage divided by current. Combined resistance is equals to combined voltage, which is 12, and combined current, which is 0.3. And we get the combined resistance as 40 
ohms. Now, the combined resistance of a series circuit is always the sum of the individual resistances. I already got the total resistance of this loop where it can only contains these two components why, uh, where this one has 28 ohms so this must be 40 minus 28 ohms so this will be having 12 ohms part b determine the potential difference v x y between points x and y so for this we need to find the potential difference at point x and potential difference at y and then subtract those values to get the potential difference between x and y so at x pd is actually the total pd in this loop minus the pd across this first lamp so the total pd which is entering this loop containing these two lamps is 12 volts and the pd across this first lamp was of 6 volts so at x the voltage will be 6 volts at y the pd is going to be the total pd for entering this loop containing these two resistors minus PD across this resistor R. So PD across this resistor R can be calculated by using the formula, the total V into resistance R divided by the combined resistance of the series circuit, which is R plus 28. So when you substitute your values, you will get the VR or the, resi or the voltage across resistor R as 3.6 volts. Now 3.6 volts is being consumed by resistor R, so leftover is 12 minus 3.6, which is equal to 8.4 volts. So now the PD across XY is the difference between 8.4 and 6. So this is 8.4 minus 6, and this is equal to 2.4 volts, hence this is the answer. Part C, calculate the ratio total power dissipated by the lamps divided by total power produced by the battery. So power dissipation has its own formula I squared by R and power produced has its formula I into V. Power dissipation by the lamps is the total current they are getting uh, into the combined resistance of both the lamps. So the current flowing across both the lamps is 0.2 amperes while the combined resistance uh, of both these lamps is 30 into 2 since each lamp has got 30 ohms of resistance so 0.2 square into 30 into 2 is the power dissipated by both the lamps and it's 2.4 watts the power produced by the battery is current and voltage across the battery so current across the battery is 0.5 and the voltage is 12 volts so 0.5 into 12 this is equals to 6 watts so 2.4 divided by 6 this gives up the ratio as 0.4 but d the resistor of resistance r is now replaced by another resistor of lower resistance state and explain the effect if any of this change on the ratio in part c a resistor of lower resistance than of r means that the ratio actually decreases so first let me write that ratio decreases the reason to that is that because the voltage across both the loops will remain the same because because these two loops are in parallel to each other so it's going to be again 12 volts and 12 volts for each of the loops so i can write that one over here voltage across r remains the same but lower resistance actually means that there's going to be a higher current drawn towards resistor r as resistance and current they are inversely proportional to each other so this means that current from the battery increases thus power produced by the battery
increases. When the denominator increases and numerator remains the same, the ratio will, of course, decrease. Question number seven. A stationary nucleus of a radioactive isotope X decays by emitting an alpha particle to produce a nucleus of neptunium-237 and 5.5 mega electron volts of energy. The decay is represented by the following equation. Part A, calculate the number of protons and the number of neutrons in a nucleus of X. So X combines both uh, neptunium and alpha particle. Alpha particle has a nuclear number of 4 and a proton number of 2. So sum of 237 and 4 gives us um, 240 nucleon number and 93 and plus 2 gives us 95 proton number. So our number of protons is going to be 95. And the number of neutrons is the difference between the nucleon number and the proton number, which is 240 minus 95, and that is equal to 146. Part B explain why the energy transferred to the alpha particle as kinetic energy is less than the 5.5 mega electron volt of energy released in the decay process, in the decay process. So um, 5.5 mega electron volt is nothing basically but the gamma radiation. So gamma radiation is also produced. Part C, a sample of X is used to produce a beam of alpha particles in a vacuum. The number of alpha particles passing a fixed point in the beam in a time of 30 seconds is 6.9 into 10 to the power of 11. Part 1, calculate the average current produced by the beam of alpha particles. So current has its formula of charge into time. The charge of the number of alpha particles is what we have to calculate first. The number of alpha particles passing in 30 seconds is 6.9 into 10 to the power of 11. These are the number of alpha particles. Each alpha particle has got two protons, means it has um, two electrons, because a neutral atom will always have equal number of protons and electrons. Um, the 6.9 into 10 to the power of 11 alpha particles will have um, will have 1.38 into 10 to the power of 12 electrons so in short we are getting 1.38 into 10 to the power of 12 electrons in every 30 seconds now each electron has a charge of negative 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs so 1.38 into 10 to the power of 12 electrons will have a combined charge of 2.208 into 10 to the power of negative 7 coulombs so our current will be 2.208 into 10 to the power of negative 7 into time is 30 and we get a current of 7.36 into 10 to the power of negative 9 amperes. But to determine the total power in watts that is produced by the decay of 6.9 into 10 to the power of 11 nuclei of x in a time of 30 seconds. So power has its own formula of n into energy divided by time. The number of particles passing this time is 6.9 into 10 to the power of 11. The energy being produced in this reaction is of 5.5 mega electron volts. But first we need to convert that to joules since that is the SI unit for energy. So each electron volt is of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 joules of energy. So 5.6, which is currently in mega electron volts, is now 5.6 into 10 to the power of 6 electron volts. So this is now being converted to joules. So I'll write this over here. And the time interval for this decay is 30 seconds. And this is how you get a power of 0 0.020 watts. Okay, so here I conclude my paper. Thank you for watching.